water. We didn't say anything about how much water it takes to do the fracking, and that's what we're all about. And I heard that water was being stored in New York somewhere, fracking water. you know anything about that? Okay, basic data. Um, yes, I didn't say anything about the actual fracking process. By How many times I use the word fracking tonight? Not, not many, right? I hate the word. You've all heard me say that. I hate the word. It, it, it's a terrible word. It, it just distracts people. Here's the analogy I've been reading. I'll get to your question in a minute, but here's the reason why I don't like to use the word fracking. The industry does. Because they want us to think that the problem is fracking, because then they can prove that it isn't. Because there's never been a single documented case of fracking ever having contaminated somebody's drinking water. And that's basically true. There have been cases, it's just not documented in the public because it's all been done privately. Here's the analogy I've been using. Last year, 32,000 Americans were killed in automobile accidents. Should we ban the internal combustion engine? The internal combustion engine is to automobile travel as fracking is to shale gas. It's an enabling technology. But it's not the problem. <laughs> What's the problem with 32,000 people being killed on the roads in, in America last year? Everything that happens before you start the engine, everything that happens while you're driving the car, and everything that happens after. Same thing. The problems are all related to the whole process, not just the fracking process. But, however, you're not going to produce anything if you don't frack. And to frack, you need water. Average gas well in Pennsylvania, shale gas well, requires 6 million gallons of water more or less. Currently in Pennsylvania, that water mostly comes from the Susquehanna River and its tributaries. Okay, so you got to have a large flow like the Susquehanna River and companies hoard it, they suck it out, put it into retention ponds, large ponds, uh, build pipelines so they can take that water without using all the truck traffic nowadays and take it to the various pads because now the pads are becoming more dense, right? If the pads are only two miles by one mile apart, you can very cheaply build a, a cheap plastic pipeline from a central water containment impoundment and pump the water through that pump pipeline to all those pads. So six million gallons goes down, eight wells on a pad, 50 million gallons. We're water rich in the northeast, but we're disposal poor. There's an irony here. Texas is in a terrible drought in California, but let's just take Texas for example because they got 18,000 shale gas wells in the Barnett. They have, last time I counted, something like 10,000 disposal wells in, in, in Texas alone. So they have no, very little water, so they have to draw down their aquifers to get enough water to do the fracking, but the waste water that comes back up called flowback, they got lots of places to put it. Just the opposite here. Pennsylvania has all kinds of water for fracking, no place to put the waste which is why some of it winds up in New York, Ohio, West Virginia, because they have, they, Ohio and West Virginia have disposal wells like Texas. We don't. So it winds up in some cases becoming brine. Let me finish that. This is very important for you to understand. This is a battle that's being fought at the EPA right now. The stuff that comes back up out of the well, it's called flowback, right? Wrong. Wrong. Produced water? Wrong. You know what it's called? Depends upon the time of day. Let me explain this. This is very well known uh, in the industry. It's very well known among regulators. It's not well known among journalists. They never get it right. You frack the well, what comes back up is called flowback. As long as the well is not in production, it's flowback. As soon as the industry declared, as soon as the operator says this well is in production, it's not flowback. It's brine or produced water. How did the liquid coming back up know that it got renamed? <laughs> is it chemically the same thing from one second to the next? Absolutely. Would you rather drink flowback that came back the first hour or the flowback that came back after five years? 
you wouldn't want to drink either, but which would you least want to drink? The stuff that's been down there a long time. Why? Because it's had all that time to absorb salts, heavy metals, and norm. The longer it's down there, the worse it is. But the longer it's down there, it's now called produced water or brine. That's legal, even in New York State. It's, it's, it's been that way since time immemorial. When it's, as long as the well is in flowback stage, it's called flowback. The, the, literally the second that the company declares the well in production, it's no longer flowback. And the regulations change. What you can do with flowback is different from what you're allowed to do with brine. That's called a loophole. So six million gallons goes down. It, it, on average, two million gallons comes back up. And now you're faced with a problem. It's flowback. That first two million gallons is flowback. You've got to do something with it. Only four things you can do with it. Anybody know what they are? What did they used to do in Pennsylvania until the industry was asked to voluntarily cease and desist from doing with it? Take it down to your sewage treatment plant and have your sewage treatment plant. Where does your sewage treatment plant flow into? In the lake. Same thing in Ithaca. We go in there. So when Ithaca sewage treatment plant, the Cayuga Heights sewage treatment plant, was accepting flowback. That sewage treatment plant is a mile from my house, and it was putting the stuff in Cayuga Lake. And a mile north, we're taking water out of Cayuga Lake to drink it. That was <laughs> West Virginia doesn't have anything on New York. Okay, so there, there are only four things you can do with it. One is you can take it to a sewage treatment plant, which is not designed to treat flowback. It's designed to treat biological waste. So it doesn't really do a very good job. So in Pennsylvania, the industry has been asked not to do that anymore. In New York, if you look at the proposed regulations, did anybody look at those? New York State was going to allow industry in New York State to dispose of flowback through sewage treatment plants, as long as the sewage treatment plant could be shown to adequately treat it. Sounds like a loophole to me. Yeah. That's one. Second thing you can do with it is take it to an industrial waste treatment plant. Where do you think the liquid waste goes from a paint plant? Where does the liquid waste go from an automobile factory? Where does the liquid waste go from a shoe factory? All industry produce liquid waste. Industry develops a specific industrial waste treatment, except for oil and gas. Well, they're not just exempt, it's uneconomic. Why should they have to pay to treat their own waste when somebody else can do it for them? So there are no industrial waste treatment plants in Pennsylvania for flowback. There are half a dozen in Pennsylvania to growing industry. It's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to come up with new techniques for literally industrially processing flowback but there's inadequate volume capability. So the third thing you can do with it is truck it someplace and dump it down an EPA-regulated class two underground injection control well that were made, made legal through the, uh, the 1974 Clean Water Act. So the EPA was given primacy. The EPA has the right to regulate the disposal of liquid waste from every industry in the country, including oil and gas through what's called a class two waste isolation well. That's a well that is either purposely drilled to inject waste or a disused oil or gas well that can accept waste. So if you have such wells, Texas has tens of thousands of them, Ohio has hundreds, Pennsylvania has 10, New York has none, you can truck the waste the flow back to those wells and you inject it back underground. The principle, if you go read that law, says what came up goes back down. You have to inject in the same formation from which you extracted. That's what the law literally says. Go read it. Can't be done in shale. Shale's impermeable. You pump six million gallons down, you only got two million gallons back, the rest of it's down there, and now what are you gonna do with the waste? You can't pump it down in the shale. You have to pump it into a different formation. And by law, that's illegal, but it's permitted. Next thing you can do is recycle it and reuse it. Two million gallons comes back up, you treat it chemically or physically to remove the solids, 
to render less harmful to the fracking process with other chemicals or anything. Like you move, remove a lot of the salt and then you re-inject it in the next well of frac fluid. That's a good thing to do. Of all the possible things to do, that's the best thing to do because you then reduce the need for new fresh water for every well and you reduce the volume of the solid waste that then has to be transported and disposed of in a landfill. As in New York accepting that stuff in our landfills from Pennsylvania. Because in Pennsylvania they're required to have radiation detectors. In New York you're not. So if that stuff is triggers the radiation detectors in Pennsylvania, it's refused. And it's happened many times. So it gets trucked across the line into landfills on our southern counties and the southern tier. And I'm terrified. I didn't know that. And the last thing you can do with it is well, the two other things. You can use it for, if you call it brine, you can use it for uh, snow and ice removal or suppression of dust on roads. Uh, and you better be very careful because you better make sure that you know that it's not just brine. It's called brine, but that doesn't mean it's brine. It's flowback. It's still flowback. Whatever flows back is flowback. Just you don't have to call flowback after you go into production. Remember that I said that? The last thing you can do is wait till a, a really dark, rainy night. And unfortunately, that's happened. And of course, in rare circumstances like in Ohio, two instances I know of, you don't even have to wait for a dark, rainy night. You just take the residual waste truck, open up the valve over storm drain. That's rare. Very rare but obviously very, very bad and very illegal. So those are the things you can do with it. And New York doesn't have access to very many of them. We don't have waste disposal. We don't have industrial waste treatment plants. We don't have disposal wells. So, and if you read the proposed regulations in the SGIS, it was suggested by DEC that companies use recycling. It's not mandatorily required in those proposed regs. It was suggested. That's not tough regulation. It gets more, every time they recycle, what comes back up is even more concentrated and it gets more difficult to recycle. So it's not a process that's sustainable. Eventually you have to shut it down and say, we've got to start over again. Ooh, how about this one? So what can town and city officials do? Um, well, we, we should be doing in towns and counties um, in New York what many have already done, which is to use zoning powers. Uh, to zone out heavy industrial activity that you do not want in your residential areas. I'm, I'm not an expert in the law. I'm certainly not a land use planner. I, I'm not an attorney. Go talk to Helen and David Slotchy, but it, I am an expert witness in the Longmont, Colorado case. The Longmont, Colorado case started because Longmont, Colorado saw what happened in New York in Dryden in Middlefield. They saw for the first time in the history of the United States, communities that had zoning on the books said, when we, see, when we mean residential, we mean residential. <coughs> Duh. <laughs> we went through the process of land use planning, all this grief and agony, and we said, this is a residential area. What happens in a residential area is residence. What happens in an industrial zone, industrial zone is not industry. You want to go drill in an industrial zone? Go ahead but not in a residential area. And New York State currently is the only state in the United States where that is enforceable, although that's being contested in the Court of Appeals in New York State right now. So Colorado said, if New York can do it, we can. Colorado's a home rule state, so is New York. So they thought there was precedent. So the city of Longmont said, we have zoning, so we're gonna make sure we uh, tell the industry that by resolution, that when we mean residential, we mean residential. We're not going to allow you to put a pad in the residential area. You want to get the gas that's under, or the oil that's under the residences? Put your pads in the industrial area and use laterals. That's what the industry does. You don't need to put a pad in the residential area. Out there they have split estate. You know what that means? The gas and oil under Longmont is owned by people in Texas. So the people in Texas say, well, why don't we just put the pads in the residential areas? That's convenient. You know, every two miles by every one mile. 
And so the people in Longmont were stuck with having, would have been stuck with having pads in their backyards, get all the paint and none of the gain because they don't own the minerals. And Longmont says, no, it's residential. So the state of Colorado is suing its own city because the state of Colorado thinks that oil and gas law trumps zoning. And let me repeat myself, there's only one state in the country right now where that is legally not true. New York. Boy, we're smart. Boy, we're wise. Boy, we're lucky. And let's just hope that holds up. I mean, we have one more, there's only one more court. The highest court in New York State is the Court of Appeals. And that, those cases are being argued right now. And we'll know within a year about whether New York will be that bright, shining light that says, no, our residences are sacrosanct. That's where kids play. That's where families grow. That's where schools are. You want to get gas and oil, go someplace else that's not zoned residential. Yeah? What you showed us, the graphs there, the income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. advising the governor uh, with, with the idea that the state might It's a good question. So if you didn't hear the question, if you look at the decline curve and the accumulation curve that I showed you, which is the basis for the economics of the whole thing, uh, who's going to make money? Does the company make money? Do the landowners make money? Is the state going to make any money? Who's advising the governor? Does the governor not understand all that? Um, I don't know what the governor knows or doesn't know. I'm making presumptions here that our governor is not stupid. I'm making presumptions that there are people inside of DEC that are not ignorant and stupid and that they understand all this and that they're being talked to by gas and oil executives. That I do know because I do talk to gas and oil executives and they tell me what they're telling the people at DEC. That's what I know. And they're telling them what I just told you these four guys are going out and saying. The reason why the oil and gas industry wants to keep the fires burning, pardon the pun, in New York is they don't want New York to set another precedent. They don't want New York to be able to say, we stopped it. That's why they're still spending millions of dollars a year in lobbying and advertising in New York. They know they're not going to make any money here. Not now. But they can't afford the public relations loss. A state not only said zoning trumps oil and gas law, but they were able to stop the entire industry from producing from shale? Wow. That's us. Is it possible? Is it possible? I, I, it's getting increasingly probable, in my opinion. There is, again, I'm not a politician. You ask the question, I'll give you my opinion. It's not any more valuable than anybody else in the room. Uh, what, what is to gain? for the governor to permit shale gas development in New York State any time in the near future. From a political perspective, there's everything to lose and nothing to gain. Because the people who aren't going to vote for him still aren't going to vote for him. And the people who were going to vote for him won't. And he can't come back and say, yeah, but it's going to bring tens of thousands of jobs and millions of dollars in severance taxes and it's going to make landowners rich. None of those things can be true right now. So there's no economic imperative. It's what I said before. It's the, the wealth of a few, some landowners, a few of them who will own the mineral rights to a few dozen wells in Broome County will make some money when the price of gas gets up to $7. Everybody else suffers the health consequences. 19.8 million people in the state of New York will be put at risk for the benefit of a few hundred landowners. That's not a good political calculus. Yes? It's okay. It drops off in 10 yeah. years. Um, so what does the gas company do with that pad, that well, in 10 years? Good question. No Good question. So the oldest shale gas wells in the U.S. right now that use the technology which I described tonight, multi-well clustered pads, long laterals, the oldest wells are seven years old. They've only come down that, that curve seven years. So most of them are still... Most are still producing. Many have been shut out, shut down. Shut, it's called shut in. Because the production rate is so low that it doesn't pay off to keep the well in production. 
You have to keep the water in production. You have to keep the compressor stations going, the dehumidification case stations going. You've got to keep the uh, pipeline rights away clear. You've got to keep coming back to empty the condensate tanks. There's a cost to keeping a well in operation. When that cost becomes higher than the value of the gas being produced, they shut it in. So we're just beginning, the answer to your question, we're just beginning to learn what the industry is going to do with 10 acres, with eight wells in the pads, that pad isn't productive anymore. What they like to say is we're going to reclaim it. But it's 10 acres with all those condensate tanks, all those pipelines, all those wellheads, all the gravel. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. <coughs> I mean, by regulation, you know, they're supposed to reclaim. But reclamation, in this case, costs a lot more. And at this point, they might have already sold the wells off to another company that has lower operating expenses, which is the tradition in the oil and gas field. The company that initially owns and operates the well is not the company that eventually plugs the well and recovers its bond from the state. That's rare. The well gets sold off to somebody else, and they sell it off to somebody else. And what happens all too often, not all the time, is that the last company walks away. And then you and I get to pay for this. Abandoned oil and gas wells. There are hundreds of thousands of them in the United States. In case you were wondering what they look like. <laughs> This is data from New York State. As of 2009, there were 64,000 abandoned oil and gas wells in New York State. 25% of them have been plugged. Plugging a well is an, is an engineering operation. It costs money. It could cost a few thousand dollars. It could cost tens of thousands of dollars. And if the company, if a company doesn't claim ownership of a well, you own it. So DEC has a budget of a few million dollars a year, a few million dollars a year to go out and find those wells, and we don't know where a lot of them are. About half of those wells are lost and abandoned. It means we don't know where they are. There are thousands of wells within 10 miles of where we are right now. Well, thousands of wells within 50 miles of where we are right now, and we don't know where they are. We didn't do a real good job of record keeping and regulating in oil and gas in New York State until about 1970. So these pictures were taken by students, high school students in Pennsylvania, and they have a club, and they walk through public land, they have the right to be on public land in Pennsylvania, with metal detectors and gas sniffers and cameras and GPS units. And they walk hand in hand through the woods trying to find abandoned wells because the state of Pennsylvania has 200,000 lost and abandoned wells. And they have no budget to go out and find them, so the students are doing it one well at a time. Who hasn't had a question yet? Yes, sir? How would you respond to someone who argues that with the economics the way they are now, there's no need for the local community to do those only I would argue that eventually you will, for the reasons that I cited tonight, everything depends upon the economics of the price of gas. If the price of gas gets sufficiently high, uh, and if you're in an area where there is enough depth and enough thickness to make a well productive, eventually you will get to a price where it will be worthwhile. Second, um, you want to make sure that you don't allow companies to do the ancillary infrastructure, building the pipelines to your community, disposing of the waste in the community. Um, there are all kinds of reasons to still say no. We're, 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 New York right now is serving as a support structure for Pennsylvania. We're, we're transit and support. There are compressor stations that have been built on the New York side of the Pennsylvania-New York line to compress the gas coming out of Pennsylvania. There, are, there is a proposal to put waste disposal wells in the extreme southwestern corner of New York. And pipeline activity is rampant in New York. Next, who else hasn't asked? Way in the back. Uh, you talked just initially about water. Um, Cuomo apparently didn't want drilling around the Catskills because that's New York City's water supply. 
has anybody tested the Susquehanna pre-fracking and is being tested periodically? We have an incredible amount of surface water here, met the standard wells. Can you address the water, water problems associated with the fracking? Well, yeah, yes. So the Susquehanna River Basin Commission has responsibility for quality and quantity of flow in the basin and eventually all the way to Chesapeake Bay, uh, including the headwaters in New York State. So the SRBC, I think, my personal opinion, is doing a very professional job of monitoring extraction. They permit extraction, obviously. Companies apply to the SRBC and they say, we want to take six million gallons of Susquehanna River Basin water and frack a well. So the SRBC does a good job of investigating to see whether the amount of water that they permitted is being taken and no more. Uh, they do extensive water quality measurements throughout the entire basin. There are literally hundreds of relatively new devices, for lack of a better word. Somebody who's a hydrologist probably knows better than I do what, what they can measure. They measure uh, alkalinity, flow rate, temperature, pH, and those things are all solar powered. <laughs> and they uplink to a satellite and all that data is being collected by the SRBC. So if you were to ask the SRBC right now, what is the state of the quality of the Susquehanna River as it leaves Pennsylvania now, as opposed to what it was like in 2006, they can tell you. I don't know the answer, but they can tell you. And in my, op my experience, every time I've contacted them and asked them for information, they were extremely forthcoming very quickly. As far as I can tell, they're not hiding anything. Was there evidence of contamination? Oh, there certainly have been um, incidences of contamination that were pursued by the Basin Commission that resulted in very heavy fines of, of violators. That has been the case. There have been very well documented blowouts and containment pond failures that resulted in um, contamination of uh, streams going into the Susquehanna River, there are well-documented cases of bubbling in streams and in the Susquehanna River, which is coming from methane migration from faulty wells. Those have all been pursued and have resulted in notices of violation and fines. <coughs> Do I think that the, fine, the value of the fine paid by the company is adequate for the insult? No. I think the amount the companies have to pay for the damage they've done should be proportional to the damage they've done, not the result of a negotiation. Again, the analogy is you get stopped for speeding, you know, the cop says it's going to cost you 270 bucks, you say, how about 50? There is negotiation, that's the problem. When, when, um, when the famous case in Dimmick arose, and the famous case in Bradford County, where 18 or 23 families had lost, lost their water well, and the DEC does, the DEP, PADEP, did an extensive investigation and determined scientifically, conclusively, that in one case Cabot, in another case Chesapeake, had caused the loss of those water wells. The fine was negotiated. Who hasn't asked the question? Peter. What's your thoughts on the President's response to this in the State of the Union. Oh, man. <laughs> the last two graphs I showed you, I wasn't kidding. The president, I'm not a president, I, you, you guys, you can imagine the pressure he's under. You know, he wants jobs, he wants economic stability, he wants energy independence, he wants energy security. Uh, we all want all those things. And, and I think he's honest in saying that he thinks that climate change is the single most important, riskiest thing that we face, not just in the United States, but worldwide. But I also think that he's, what words would I use here? That I'm, I'm going I'm to be quoted, I know. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I think he's either misinformed by his advisors, his scientific advisors, or 
he's hoping that it isn't going to be as bad as people think it's going to be. That's the only thing I can conclude. He's not stupid. He's not ignorant. I think he cares very much just like we do for the people of the country. Um, but from a purely scientific point of view, let's separate out politics from economics, from science, from public relations, from advertising. They're all, they're all in their own regimes. Right? You, can be t you can be purely scientific and never enter the political regime. You can be purely political and ignore all the science. Same thing with economics and sociology. There are all these sciences that are in a well-functioning society are supposed to be combined and interacting and informing each other. So when the president, in all three of his most recent State of the Union addresses, says, we have 100 years of natural gas, well, he's wrong. Scientifically, he's wrong. We don't. And we'll have even less if we start exporting it as LNG. So he can't say, let's export and help our balance of trade, and then say, we're going to be energy independent. Well, no, you can't say that. And you can't also say from a purely scientific point of view, and a State of the Union address is not a science address, remember, it's a socio-economic political address, and unfortunately he has to venture into science, and then he gets it wrong and say, we're going to do everything we can to fight climate change, all the above. The last two graphs I showed you says you can't do that. You can't do all the above and fight climate change. This can't be done from a scientific point of view. From a political point of view, you want to make that case because it makes you look like you're doing the right thing for the oil and gas industry. It makes you look like you're doing the right thing for climate change. It makes you look like you're doing the right thing for consumers because you're saying your energy costs are going to go down. Yeah. When's the last time your energy costs went down? So that's my answer. I, I would, would I love to have a conversation with them? <laughs> yeah. One more? One more? We'll do, we'll do one more. Last one. I have a question. Apparently, Sue Ben County has the most signed leases in the United States. Sue Ben County, based on the geology, has the amount of ever The fact that it's very, very water rich, it has two primary aquifers and a bunch of principal aquifers. A lot of the landowners down there have signed leases with Chesapeake. It allows Chesapeake to come onto that land and take the water for free. Yeah. What is the likelihood that they will travel that far to get the water from Sudan and parts of Ontario down Um Depending upon what the Susquehanna River Basin Commission continues to do or not do, um, for example, last summer, you might recall this, we were in Pennsylvania, was in drought, and the SRBC halted extraction from the river. Companies had to go someplace else to get the water. They came to Steuben. They came to 